Hi, I'm Colin Hansen. I'm the editorial director of the Gospel Coalition. I'm joined here today by Pete Weiner and Michael Gerson. Uh, Pete Weiner was the director of the White House Office of Strategic Initiatives and deputy assistant to President George W. Bush. He's now a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Michael Gerson was chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush, also senior policy advisor, the columnist for the Washington Post, and a fellow at the One Campaign. Thank you guys for, for joining me today. Well, Pete, what about the political and the spiritual climate right now led you to write the book, City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era? Well, Mike and I felt like uh, we're at a, um, a plastic moment, a fluid moment, the political movement um, that had dominated um, politics for evangelicals for more than a quarter century has essentially faded away. The religious right, the uh, leaders of the religious right, have either literally passed away or are passing from the scene. And the movement that is going to replace them and it uh, isn't uh, in place yet. It's not clear what it'll look like, uh, what direction it's going to go in. And Mike and I had some thoughts um, about what the answer to those questions should be. And um, we wanted to try and, and uh, shape that conversation and, uh, and that discussion. Um, and also, this is a subject that Mike and I have thought about um, and talked about and prayed about for a lot of years. We've addressed it episodically here and there now and then, um, but never systematically. And we thought that this would be a chance when we left the White House uh, to put our minds together and to think through what uh, we think uh, evangelical Christian should do and the kind of political engagement they should, uh, they should have uh, from, uh, from here on out. Well, Mike, let's talk about some of the specific issues that are addressed in the book. Uh, Tim Keller in his foreword for City of Man describes it as a guidebook to the political issues that will have to be addressed. What are some of those issues? Well, we hope it's a guidebook to uh, not just political issues, but to, to a way of thinking about politics. Um, we've had in the um, religious, among religious conservatives for 30 years a largely defensive movement. So there's a Supreme Court decision, or there's some perceived aggression from the culture. And, uh, and Christians have often reacted to those things, which is understandable. Um, but we wanted to step back and say, well, if we weren't reacting, if, if we were looking at first principles, beginning with basic commitment, the basic Christian commitments, what would our social engagement look like? Um, and we, in, you know, analyze that in several different areas, in, in uh, you know, related to order, to prosperity, to justice, and other themes, um, and try to begin to uh, draw the principles of a Christian worldview as it relates to political engagement. Now that has to be done in every time, um, because times change, issues change. Um, you know, the circumstances of Christians change in different societies. If you were in a totalitarian society, you would have a different set of duties. Um, in a representative democracy, you, you know, there, there is a duty of participation. And we're, uh, you know, we want to analyze that from a broad perspective and then begin to raise a series of issues, not a 10-point plan um, for the next stage, but really, what are the categories that Christians should be thinking about um, when it comes to their political engagement? Well, Pete, what is unique about an evangelical approach to politics? I think what evangelicals bring to politics uh, is a view um, of human anthropology, of the nature of the human person, and uh, what they are owed because they are creatures um, made in the image of God. And our view, and the view I think of uh, many Christians, is that um, there's human rights and human dignities that goes along with being a human being. And the role of the state is to um, protect those and advance those and advance uh, human flourishing. So I think evangelicals uh, bring that and the greatest contributions uh, that Christians have made in politics throughout history are those who have taken this issue of human anthropology um, very seriously. I think another thing that Christians uh, bring to the public square and to the political debate is uh, an appreciation for being citizens of uh, two kingdoms. Uh, we're citizens of uh, the city of man and citizens of the city um, of God. And I think that that ought to instruct and animate um, 
not only the issues that we deal with, but the manner in which we deal with them. Well, Mike, evangelicals have been very closely affiliated, sometimes explicit ways, sometimes merely by observers with the religious right. You guys write about the demise of the religious right. Um, where did the religious right lose its way? But also, where are the ways that we can even, going forward, continue to learn from what the religious right did? Well, we, we try to have a balanced critique in the book. Uh, the, um, the religious right had many democratic virtues and achievements. It led Christians back into social engagement beginning in the 1970s after a period where Christians had withdrawn from the, from the public debate after the fundamentalist modernist controversy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, it engaged them in politics in a way they had not been before, and that's important for our entire society. Um, it raised a series of moral issues um, that remain quite important. I'm strongly pro-life. I believe very much in, in, in family issues. And, uh, you know, the, the religious right, we argue in the book, didn't, didn't bring the kingdom of God and didn't achieve everything it wanted. Um, but it did prove that these issues have a real uh, value, importance, and appeal in America and continue to do so. Um, some of the problems, though, going forward with the religious right, there were, as Pete, men Pete mentioned, there were problems of tone, um, essentially adopting the tone of your opponents. Um, and uh, we mentioned several examples in the book of, uh, of how, uh, instead of reflecting a different approach to politics, that the religious right had, uh, you know, adopted a very typical one um, as far as tone is concerned. There's matters of strategy. Um, the religious right became, I think, too closely associated with just one political ideology. Okay? Um, now that, you, you know, so you would have voter guides for the religious right that dealt with a variety of issues that weren't necessarily, uh, you know, on the Christian agenda, but were very much on the Republican agenda um, and came, became too closely identified as a partisan movement instead of a movement of conscience informing uh, the, the political debate. And we argue in the book that there was a theological problem in the, in the religious right um, in identifying America as somehow the new Israel um, and then making arguments and claims that, uh, that uh, American suffering or problems in our country or other countries was, were related to national sins. Mike, let's talk about a couple historic examples of successful reform movements led by evangelicals. One well-known, the Civil Rights Movement. You guys write about it in City of Man. Another would be Prohibition. Successful in that the Constitutional Amendment was passed. Unsuccessful in that widely, widely disparaged since then. What would be the difference between those movements, strategically or uh, theologically? What, what made one last until, one, what made one be a good example today and one a reason to be where? Well, I, you know, I think there is a difference there. And it, sh it shows the difference between two types of Christian political engagement. Um, there's one type of political political engagement that says that we should seek preference for Christian ideals and moral views in, in society. You know, that we're somehow a Christian nation and we should have uh, laws that reflect uh, essentially Christian theological beliefs. Okay. Um, that's very common, you know, throughout history. Um, but we, the Civil Rights Movement represented a different strain uh, of this, which is not that we would seek preference for Christianity as a community of, 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 and, and its moral views, um, but that we would take a view of human rights and dignity rooted in the Christian faith that comes out of the Christian faith and apply it to everyone. Um, that seems to me the more compelling Christian model in a lot of ways, is not to seek preference for our own theological convictions and ideas, but to take those theological convictions and ideals and what they say about the nature of justice and the rights of human beings and apply it more broadly. James Davison Hunter, in his widely influential book, uh, To Change the World, 
has recommended that Christians should be silent for a season and serve the common good through, as he quotes, acts of shalom rather than law, policy, and political mobilization. How do you respond to that recommendation? Well, I have great respect for, for Jim Hunter and, and for his book. His critique, particularly of Christian social engagement, is one we largely agree with. Um, I, but I do have concerns about that type of statement, that somehow Christians can take a break from, pol from politics because they've done it badly. Um, the, the, there are a couple of problems with that viewpoint. One of them is that in a representative democracy, we're citizens with continuing responsibilities. Um, you can't say just because you have concerns about the nature of engagement that you, can, you give up on your democratic responsibilities. Um, you know, we're in a totalitarian society, it might be the responsibility of the believer just to live out their faith in fidelity. Um, um, in a representative democracy, we share in the responsibilities of government. It's our job um, to engage in these things. And so you can't, you can't dismiss that or, or suspend it. Um, I would also add that at any given moment in American politics, um, there are great issues of justice and compassion at stake. Um, so that you can't say, well, well, we'll take a break. Because right now, you know, we're, we, we may be debating issues having to do with AIDS policy in Africa or, you know, malaria or the nature of the family or issues of life. Um, those things can't just be waited on. Um, they have to be engaged because they're raised at the moment. Um, and so, you know, that, that also creates a set of moral duties for Christians as, as, we, as we move forward. There is a historical example uh, that we deal with in the book that relates to this and kind of uh, end the book with. Um, you know, during the middle of the, the toughest days of the Civil Rights Movement, there were Christian pastors in Birmingham, Alabama, who urged Martin Luther King to stop pushing so hard, <laughs> um, to stop seeking legal change, making essentially the argument that cultural change had to precede legal change, that it was more important or primary. Um, and King's response in the letter from the Birmingham jail was, I think, very effective, which is people that make that argument that say we need to delay or we can wait on these questions are not the ones who are suffering the injustices themselves. Um, and that's true in, in our country with children who are in failed schools. It's true in the world with people in, in need of, you know, of AIDS drugs. Um, for someone to say we need to take a break from political engagement is, could, is a statement that could only be made by comfortable people. Um, because there are some people who, who depend greatly and immediately and urgently on, on the right kind of political involvement at any given moment. I agree with, with what Mike says, and I'd only add that I think what we need is not a period of disengagement, but a period of the right kind of engagement. Um, I think that's the, that's the key uh, distinction. Um, because as Mike said, uh, in every generation, uh, in every time, there are great matters of justice uh, and human rights that are at stake. So I wouldn't devalue either of those elements. It's very, very important for Christians to be creating great works of art, um, you know, that affect, uh, you know, cultural norms. Um, but those cultural norms are also affected by the laws by which we govern our lives. Why do you think then, Mike, that so many Christians are increasingly attracted to a libertarian view, uh, believing that laws really can't change hearts and minds. So, again, let's adopt a more libertarian stance. Well, there are a lot of virtues to libertarianism, particularly in its description of economic reality. Um, but I, I, there is also a long tradition of Christian reflection on these issues that's not necessarily consistent with that perspective. Um, you know, Christians have traditionally believed, informed by the scriptures, um, that there are individuals have rights and values, but there's something more than that. Um, that justice is not just defined by giving individuals their rights. Okay? That justice is defined in some way by the way the broader society treats the weakest members among us. Um, 
And the reality is, in an entirely libertarian system dominated by individual choice, there can be great injustice, um, you know, as we see in, in life issues and other, uh, other questions like this. And sometimes the government has to step in and defend the people who are weakest, that can't compete in that, uh, that conflict of rights that comes out of, out of a libertarian orientation. Yeah, there's, I think there's another um, point to be made, which is that uh, the, the state, the government, is a divine institution. I and mean, it's throughout the scriptures. It's been sanctioned and given to us by God. And I think sometimes conservative Christians, and, and we are conservative Christians, make a mistake of denigrating government in a way that's harmful. And I want to make a, a point about this. Just if you look at a couple of issues where we've made the greatest social progress in the last 20 and 25 years, um, welfare and crime, uh, that happened not because government was cut or limited, it's because government was changed uh, in order to advance smarter, better policies. Well, thank you again for joining me and talking about these weighty issues and for writing City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era.